Arise from the dead. Every one of you before salvation were dead people. Amen. The problem is the church has gone to sleep and still looks dead. Amen. Yeah. We are representations of the kingdom of God, of a resurrected God that conquered sin and death and rose on the third day. Like my wife just shared during worship, when they meet you, they should be meeting Jesus, not you. Amen. Your old self was supposed to be crucified. You're a new creation of God in Christ. Amen? Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. So important that we get to a vision spiritually of what God requires of us and how He sees us, so that we know that we know that we know in our hearts that when we go out, when people meet you, if you go to the store, you go out to eat this afternoon, they should be meeting God. They should feel His presence emanating out of you. Because you're supposed to be sifted vessels with the glory of God living through you. Amen. Amen. I know it wasn't just me. <clears throat> it is so important today that the body of Christ realized why He created the church. On the day of Pentecost, the church age began that morning when tongues of fire fell. He created it to take the kingdom of God into all the earth. The reason they were persecuted, they would have stayed in Jerusalem and Israel had it not been for persecution. They would have stayed in their homes, they would have ministered, they would have laid hands on the sick, people would have gotten saved, but it wouldn't have went any further unless He drove them out of their comfort zone. Because let me tell you something, the days we're in, you're going to face persecution when you see what our government is doing. Michael Youssef wrote a book, I don't know how old it is, I got it at home, when the crosses are gone. You have a bunch of Marxists in our government, a bunch of globalists that hate you, your freedoms, and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's in the White House, and that's what's in the Senate, that's what's in the House, that's what's in the Congress. And it's time the body of Christ woke up and said, we're not going to take this anymore. You're, going to tell, you're not going to tell us how to live, how to believe, and what to believe. They're forcing this agenda. It's called the woke agenda. Well, let me tell you something. America's had enough. We're rising up. And it's time the people in the pulpit looked at the United States government and says, you don't tell us what to do. You don't tell us what to preach. You don't tell us what to believe in. And until the Christians start standing up, this government's going to get away with what it can. It's pushing people as far as they can be pushed. And I can tell you right now, there's an awakening in America, but the awakening has to come in us first. They have to see a church on fire, a church that doesn't bow to this perversions that they're forcing on us and your children. Amen. They're after your children. They're not even after you. They're after to defile our children. The stuff they're teaching our kids in school, my God, I can't believe God's even had mercy on our school system that it's not burned to the ground by the holy fire. Because let me tell you something, when, you, when a child is born it comes out of its mother's womb, you know if it's a male or a female. There's no questions. God does not make mistakes. Amen? Amen. He created two sexes. End of conversation. It's from beginning to end. He created marriage between a man and a woman. End of conversation. It's not up for debate, but they don't want to debate because they don't want the truth to be told. That's right. right. Truth is what's going to convict them and bring them to their knees. And you better start speaking truth to people. Because the compromising church is going to be done away with. There's not, I was even reading Revelation, the lukewarm church. Forget lukewarm. You're either hot or you're cold nowadays with Christ, or you're not walking with Him. Oh, hallelujah. Remember something. You're not here to make friends out there. You're not here to make friends. Your best friend is Jesus. Leave it there. Because when you witness for Jesus, let me tell you something, you're not, people aren't going to like you a lot. Amen. You're going to see where their hearts are at. Luke, the second chapter, when, they, when Jesus, they took him in on the eighth day, he said, at the mention of his name, the hearts of many are going to be revealed. He was only eight days old, and it was prophesied over, hey, they're not going to like your son much. Amen. <laughs> so if they don't like him much, they probably won't like you much. But it's okay, you know what, they're just being convicted. They're being convicted because of the carrier that's in you. Your temple is carrying a holy God, and it convicts them. Ephesians 5, verses 8 to 14. For you were once darkness. What did that say? What's that word? Once. Once. You are no more. But now you are light in the Lord. That's Matthew 5, 13 to 16. You're the salt and the light of the earth. Live that way. 
light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Find out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. O oh, Jesus! And we pray that the light of the gospel fall upon this government, fall upon our school systems, fall upon corporate America and every world's so-called leader. You know who the only leader is? Jesus Christ. Amen. Like I said, there's one King, one Lord, one God, one Savior. His name's Jesus. It starts and ends with Him. But you're awake to what? 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. This is what you're up against. I'm sorry, there's ignorance in the church today. There's so much ignorance. Yeah. I heard some preaching yesterday by Mario Murillo. It changed this whole sermon. Thank you, Lord. you got to know something. 90% of the people you listen to on TV are a bunch of frauds. They're after your money. They're after your money. Do I tell you the importance of tithing in this house? You bet. Because if you're afraid to put it into the kingdom, that means money owns you, not God. If you don't trust Him, He's going to multiply what you give. That's why we don't do formulas in here. But I saw a video yesterday about a pastor, worldwide pastor. A woman had a dream. I'm going to tell you his name. But in the dream, she was sitting in a prison cell, in a woman's prison. This is how far these pastors and ministers, so-called ministers of the gospel of Christ, have fallen. Remember something. That is not a, a self-help book that's in your lap. It's the Holy Word of God, written by the Holy Spirit through holy men of God. And she sat in the cell, and she was crying out to God, and this minister came, it was in a dream, and sat next to her. And she thought he was there to pray for her and to help her. So he finally says, no, here, read my book. Didn't hand her a Bible. Didn't pray for her. Said, here, this is how you get better. This is how you'll be successful. She prayed and God said, so many of my children have no discernment. They don't pay attention to what they're hearing. There's so much bad love. He didn't pray for her. Didn't. He gave her a self-help book that got him rich. This man runs a worldwide ministry. It's worth probably a couple hundred million dollars. And, and he told her, he says, until my church wakes up and stops listening to this nonsense and starts discerning what they're listening to. Jesus warns us about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, religious speaking. Too many ministers, and I'm not judging anybody because they're not going to stand before me, but let me tell you something. You better guard your ears, your ears. I pray for spiritual hearing for everybody in here and everybody watching online. Because let me tell you something, the day of judgment on that pulpit is coming. I kid you not when I tell you I fear getting up here on Sundays and Wednesday nights. Because God have mercy on my soul if I ever lead anybody astray with that Bible that I've been entrusted with. I'm entrusted with the gospel. But let me tell you something. In this house, you're all ministers. You are also have the same trust by God, given by God, when you got born again to be ministers of that word. I have the right kind of fear of God. But I would never, I never, because I was warned, you will never be a people pleaser in the pulpit. If you're out there pleasing people, you're not preaching the gospel. You are not telling them the reality of their sin. Never judge them because we're not qualified. Judge the sin, never the person. But you better test their character. When it says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, you hang around darkness long enough, you know what, you're going to go back to it. When I got born again and delivered on a Sunday morning, I didn't call my dealers. I didn't have any more parties in my house. I didn't go back to all the bars that I knew all over the South Bay and West Los Angeles and Long Beach and Lakewood and everywhere else. I didn't go back to the pile of poop that I lived in. Amen. You know why? I've been cleaned up. I've been set free. So I had no more fellowship with it. And guess what? When I went back in, the one German deli ever looked at me like I had the plague. Except the guy that led me to the Lord, the two owners that were Christians that were praying for me all those years. They came and hugged me. The rest of them put their head down. I was no longer their so-called friend. I became a friend of Jesus that Sunday morning. And so guess what? I didn't go hang out there anymore. 
I went and got food there and I left with it. Because <laughs> I wasn't comfortable and neither were they. See, when you give your heart to Jesus, I don't want a fellowship with any works of darkness. Do I go out and witness to it? When I'm in the stores, when I'm out, you bet I do. How are they going to know about the light unless you give it to them? But I don't fellowship with it. Who you choose your friends to hang out with, let me tell you something. You hang around with those that don't know Jesus long enough and you're going to start thinking like they think again. Amen. Don't think you're that strong that you can't be deceived and you can't fall. Amen? Amen? It says even the elect are going to be deceived in the last days. And they are, like I said, that dream that that woman had about this man, I already knew it. But it changed the sermons I had about Mario Malo. It changed this to a warning sermon to the body of Christ, especially to those in the pulpit. We have people in here that teach. This is to all of you, too. Remember who you represent today. We represent Jesus. We've been entrusted with the gospel, like Paul said. You can put your name in there. I, Paul, no, you put your name in there. Have been entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We represent this book. I wish we got it perfect every day. Oh, Maria, you, you got that. Praise God. She should smile. We should smile. You know what's great about Jesus? One of the, one of the greatest things about His love for us, He knows you're not going to get it perfect every day. Amen. I mean, Dean gets it right every day, but praise God. Somebody's got to, brother. Yeah, got to have an example. <laughs> you know, but we should smile. That's how much He loves us. He knows you're not going to get perfect every second of every day. I told you, your day of perfection, when you, you're going to get up and go, God, I got it all together. You're home. You're home. You're home. You're in a heavenly body. You're home. You're done now. But the process is something we have to embrace as Christians. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans, the 13th chapter. The church needs to become alive again. Like I said, the church for too long... It actually started, even that Jesus Revolution movie from Greg Glory, that started in the hippie movement. They become people seekers instead of God seekers to ministers. Yes, we want every soul saved, amen? amen? I want everybody on this planet saved. Like I said, I've been to heaven, I've been to hell. I don't want anybody going what I saw. I don't want one person, I don't care how bad they are. Because I can't judge them. I, I, I remember from whence God brought me. Okay, I, I was the best friend of the devil. So I can't sit there and say, oh, you devil worshippers. No, I used to be one. <clears throat> now, none of you were, right? You all were born saints. I used to be a devil worshipper, too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Amen. But the thing is, too, once you become born again, we're to look like the light of Christ. Amen? Amen. We're carriers of the light now. Yes. We're a bearer. We're a light bearer. So it's so important, this church, I'm telling you something, until people see the life of Christ manifested in you, why would they want to know about Him? Mm -hmm. There has wow. to be evidence that you've been changed, your heart's been changed. Yes. Amen. I'm telling you something, if you leave here today, my wife and I will go out to eat today, and I walk in that restaurant where they wait for us to get there most times, because people need prayer or something, they, we've known them for the last 12 years, so I can go minister in a restaurant because it's owned by Christians. So when I walk there and pray for someone, they're going, yeah, hallelujah. See, because that's what they want. They want that not just to be a place for food, but for Christ to rule and reign in it. See, whatever you're doing in life, give it to Christ. Tell Him to rule and reign over what you do, and then watch Him prosper. Amen? Amen. So it's so important today that you see, that you see, that you know in your heart that you're not... The life that you're to live now is a spiritual life, not your old life. You know why most Christians are dead? They're still walking around in their flesh and not in the spirit. Amen. Mm. Yeah. True. Gloria got that one. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Romans 13, 11 to 14. And do this knowing that now is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. <laughs> the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in reverently in drunkenness and lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. That's a life of denying yourself, picking up the cross and following Him. Putting on Christ, Isaiah 61.10.
You have garments of salvation and a robe of righteousness. You got new clothes the day you got yes. born again. Yes. You don't let anything defile those clothes. You, you're clothed with the Lord Jesus. He not only does He live in you, He clothed you with His salvation mm -hmm. and with His garment, that robe of righteousness, the garments of salvation. So have no fellowship with the works of darkness. Stand against the darkness. Never agree with what they're saying out here. Never. Never, never, never. It is so time the church says, no, we're not agreeing with you. You know how many denominations are agreeing with this whole move of whatever it is, of perversion? How can you be a minister and get up there and promote something and agree with something and say God's okay with it when He flooded the earth and burned two million people yeah. to the ground in Sodom and Gomorrah because of what they're promoting? Yeah, I'm sorry, God is not okay with the church saying this is acceptable to Him. Amen. Nobody can tell me they know Christ and agree with this stuff and say it's okay. If you come in here like that, we will love you, we will help you. But if you don't come in this ministry to be changed and to get right with Christ, you won't stay here long. I won't chase you out. The Holy Ghost will do that. Because it's just a holy sanctuary. You are a holy priesthood. You are a holy nation of believers. We don't bend for nobody but Jesus. My knee bends to Jesus and to this holy word. Because I fear this word. The problem is, we talked about it years ago. Deborah King said in the Bible study, we need to be in love with the word again. Yes, we do, but we also need to be in fear of this word. Because if you don't fear this word... You have no real awe and reverence of a holy God. Remember, He's not love first. I got you quiet. He's holy. Remember, He's holy above all else. God is love because that's who He is. But He is holy. And He is so holy, it's going to bring this word in His holiness and His righteous anger. That's where the correction is going to come. And I'm sorry, it's going to come here. And it should come to the pulpit. I was warned before my first Sunday school class, you will never be a people pleaser from the pulpit, Dennis Boylan, or I can't use you. I was a brand new Christian. Would you say? Galatians 1.10 says exactly that. See what my wife said today? This word is our corrector. It corrects and it convicts us because if you start going this way and God says, come sit with me and read my word and you don't want to, you're, you don't want to be corrected. I don't know about the rest of you, I don't know how many times he's corrected me. I don't count. <laughs> None of you have ever needed correction. Well, we know famous Earl has. Praise God. And Ellen's never been corrected. Thank you, Jesus. She just came out perfect. Thank you, Ellen. It's good to have you back. Yes. When I say Isaiah 61.10, the garments of salvation, the robe of righteousness, and Jeremiah talks about taking off your grave clothes. We've talked about this before. When you were raised from the dead, when you were baptized into his death and raised from his dead with Christ, you got a whole new set of garments on. You got a brand new suit. The problem in the church today is they want to live in their old suit and worship Jesus at the same time. Yeah? I heard a man speak to 900 pastors yesterday. Oh my God. I was waiting for the mercy part. That didn't come. He called them all out. I told them they better start preaching the gospel again. They better start preaching about holy living again. They better start doing what God commands them to do again. Because there's no use it for Christians. I'm sorry. You're never going to fulfill your destiny. You're never going to have that fullness of joy and peace in your heart when you lay your life down and let Him rise up in you. I'm sorry. When you got buried with Christ, your old man was supposed to remain in the tomb. Too much in the church today tells you, oh, you're okay the way you are. No, you're not. No, you're not. If you still think the way your old person was, then you're not okay yet. You need transformation. You need the Word inside of you to change you from the inside out. And we all go through this. If you're afraid of change, then you're never going to walk in the ways of God. I'm sorry, humanness is not pleasing to God. And, and it breaks God's heart what's going on when He sees what these men... I talked to my wife yesterday. God showed me that as a baby Christian. I said, what's with all these denominations? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me so clear, one day so loud when I was praying and asking about this, He says, denominations never came from me. I never made Baptists or Methodists or Lutherans or Catholics or anything else. I made the body of Christ to be one body with many parts in many locations. He said that was the work of Satan when the first denomination started. 
It was the work of the devil through people thought they were honoring me by putting a name on it. All these denominations, oh, you have to get saved my way and your way. No, there's one way, your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Father raised him from the dead on the third day. You confess who you are, you confess him, then you'll be saved. It says, all who call upon his name shall be saved. So don't give me any doctrines on how to get saved. The Bible tells you, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Confession with thy mouth will come mm -hmm. unto salvation of Jesus. So don't get into all these doctrines. And we got to pray that every denomination get exposed for their heresies and the stuff they're preaching. Because I'm sorry, it's not acceptable to God. He doesn't change. And the church better rise up and be a remnant mm -hmm. church Amen. that doesn't bow to this stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. You know why they're getting away with it? Because the church isn't saying anything. When you get up in the devil's face and say, bow at the name of Jesus, take you and your perversions out of our school system, yes. out of our government, yes. this is one nation under God, when the pulpit starts screaming that, and the congregation starts screaming that, let me tell you something, you're going to see a change in the Holy Ghost. Ooh, Jesus. Ooh, man, thank you, Jesus. Ooh, hallelujah. Now you got me all fired up. <laughs> Ephesians 2. Hmm. Hmm. Mm. It's 1 to 10, but just verses 1 and 2. Well, real, God's really trying to stress today, you were once dead people, but now you're alive. That's where the joy and the peace comes. Your old self is not alive. It's not supposed to be. Your new spiritual self is alive. That's why I smile. People say, how do you smile? How do I smile? I'm on my way to heaven. I'm on my way to heaven. Got an awesome ministry. You're awesome saints. I'm blessed in here. I got a beautiful godly wife that sings at home every day. We worship together. We read the word together. I mean, it doesn't, I'm sorry, it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah, I want to see the whole world saved, but that's down the road, okay? But I know that time is coming now. The latter rain is here for harvesting of billions of souls. Let me tell you something. The church has to go back to going, Lord, show us how to seek the lost. How to restore the ones that have fallen away yes. from their call and get them back into yeah. the body of Christ. Get them back into a church building somewhere. Too many Christians are sitting at home this morning because they've given up. You know why? Because there's no fire in the church. I pray there's fire in here every day. I told you I want electric buzzers in the seats so nobody falls asleep. <laughs> oh, oh, four, seat six. <laughs> <laughs> But if the preaching is good, they won't fall asleep. <laughs> I'm coming out of my shell this year. Ephesians 2, 1 through 2. Watch this. And he made you alive who were dead. Made alive how? In the spirit. Remember, your flesh didn't get born again. Your Adam and Eve nature died that day. The rebellious nature. The unholy nature. When they rebelled against God in the garden, your spirit was made new, not your flesh. Now he's restoring my flesh. I'm healthier now than I was 40 years ago. You know why? Because I was made new by the spirit of life. Mm. That verse kept coming to me all night long. John 6, 63, one of my favorite Bible verses. Jesus said, the words, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit. And they are life. The life that He has for us is blessed and prospered, healed and whole and complete. Mm. See, and I confess that over us every day. I confess that over my wife and I every day. Gentlemen, water your wife with the Word and you'll have a happy wife. Yes. It works. Take my word for it. Amen? Amen? Amen. <laughs> you were dead in trespasses and sin in one... There's that word once again. In, you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. See, over and over, Paul by the Holy Spirit stresses, you were dead, you were dead, you were, were, past tense. But leave your own nature in the tomb. One of the hardest things to do is to deny yourself to your old self and your old attitudes. Now all of you have a perfect attitude this morning, right? <laughs> Amen. We know you do that best. Yeah. <laughs> Colossians 2.13 And you being dead in your trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made alive together with Him, that's Christ, having forgiven you all trespasses. In 1 John it says, As He is, so are you in this world. 
See, you're a brand new spiritual creation. When you all were dead and you got baptized into his death, raised into the newness of life, you have to see yourself not as a carnal person anymore, but as a spiritual person. That's why I pray in tongues now more than ever. I get up praying in tongues. I go to bed praying in tongues. As soon as I raise my hands and start worshiping God in the morning in my office, I'm praying in tongues. Because I'm a spiritual being. I'm not a carnal being. This I have to fight down and knock it down every day. Sometimes I've got to say, flesh, behave yourself. You have authority over your flesh. Amen. Yeah, we do. He gave us dominion over That's it. Right. Adam and Eve gave it up, so they were just carnal from that point on. But yet God still walked with them, still talked with them. They didn't die carnally. They died spiritually. You've been brought back to life. We have to remember something. When you got born again, Adam and Eve's nature, which you had, got put in the tomb with Jesus. When you were raised, you were raised a spiritual creation, not a carnal one. And it's seeing yourself as a brand new. When he says all things are new in First uh, Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter, what it is that new creation is a spiritual created being. You're just like Adam and Eve before they fell. Do you know that? You are now spiritually just like them. You should be able to see the things of the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, pray in the Spirit. You should have the same communion with God that they had before they fell. Yeah, look how quiet you got. Don't be afraid of it. He's only going to burn out of you what interferes with that intimacy. In the New American Standard, it says He's intimate with the upright. He's intimate with you. He lives in you. Let the intimacy be your desire today. And then God will change you. And then He can really walk with you, talk with you, speak with you. It should just be like them. Read the first chapter of Genesis. They walked with Him in the garden before they fell. Think about that. We don't walk with God. He's your best friend. Amen. Even my wife did yesterday. She goes, God told me not to take any music today. And I went, God stopped the show. What do you mean? You always take music. We walk together, she's got music, so I just kind of tagging along. <laughs> so, uh, because music is, she's a worshiper. And she loves her worship when she's walking and talking. But yes, they said, no, I just want you to be quiet. Just listen to me today. See what I'm saying? Sometimes you got to turn all the noise off. I love listening to classical music when I'm studying for sermons and Bible studies in the mornings or in the afternoons. I love it. It just does something for me. But there's some days I unplug that, I take the CD out, and I put my head on the Bible, and sometimes I just get real quiet, because he wants to say something. He wouldn't be waking you up at 3 o'clock in the morning if you were listening during the day. That's for somebody. Amen. Boy, God. Second Peter. This is where the morning really starts. We're just going to read the first three verses. Well, when you get home, read the rest of that chapter. What happens to false teachers and false prophets? It's in Jeremiah. It's in a lot of the Old Covenant. It's so important today that you see what you represent. That's why when I tell you how serious I am about standing up here, I know what happens to those and what's going to happen to a lot of people that stand before people this morning around the world and preach something that isn't of Christ anymore. There's too many people get up and they use two or three, four scriptures like they were taught in cemetery school. And guess what? No, that's what they teach you. They, I've had pastors tell me that. No, when I went to college for this, they told me, just use about three or four scriptures and just tell them the story again. Give them something good for Sunday morning. No, I'm up here to give you the word. So that when you leave here, you're equipped. So that you fear no one but God. But it's the right kind of fear. I have the right kind of fear of God. It's an awe and reverential fear of somebody so holy that died for me. That loves me. That knows I'm not perfect. Don't say a word back there. So, <laughs> so it's so important that you see today, stop trying to be perfect. Just follow Jesus. We were, we were coming home the other night, and we were talking about what's going on in the world and stuff like that. And this, one of my favorite songs come on. Just give me Jesus. I sang that from the post office all the way home. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. You can take the whole world, but you can't take Jesus from me. Because Jesus is in me. That's why we sang it today. We live and move our have our being. Because just give me more Jesus. 
You have to want more Jesus than you want anything else in this world. Stop looking at what you don't have. Stop thanking God for what you do have and who you are in Christ. Amen. Amen. That's why some of the breakthroughs don't happen in most Christians' lives. They're looking ahead for what they want instead of what God's got for them today. You know why most Christians can't be used Sunday afternoons? Because they're worried about Monday mornings. Amen. Why? Matthew 6, don't worry about tomorrow. So we'll have enough trouble all its own. See, but I don't expect trouble tomorrow. Because it says in Psalm 23, goodness and loving kindness is going to follow me all the days of my life. It's going to follow me. When I leave here today, goodness and mercy are going to follow me when I leave. When I came to church this morning, goodness and mercy followed me yes. all the way in the door. Right. When I go home tonight, goodness and mercy is going to follow me to my house. When I get up tomorrow morning, goodness and mercy is going to follow me everywhere I go. Think about that. His, it's a promise. His goodness and mercy are going to follow you all the days of your life. See, I look at the goodness of God instead of the nightmare that's in the world right now. Because you know why? You know why the world's going crazy? Because the devil's days are numbered. And Jesus is coming soon. Hallelujah. That's why he's mad. Your job is to go out and share the joy of the Lord with people, which is our strength. But if you look at the world, you're going to lose your joy, you're going to lose your peace. I refuse to let this world and the devil take my place. I enjoy getting up every morning and praying for the salvation of everybody on this planet. Because I know that sends darkness into a tailspin. I pray for the healing of their broken hearts. I pray for the restorations of their souls. I pray for the healing in families. Big John and Marianne, they just lost two people from their family last week. What a devastation. See, this stuff, life happened suddenly. Man died on a motorcycle here yesterday, this intersection. See, the loss of life happens, and I don't care who you are, I don't care when you know it's coming, it still affects you and affects everybody around you. And even when you know it's coming, it doesn't help. But these unexpected ones like this one for Big John and Marianne, their family never saw this coming. And these are the things, I'll be honest, church, I don't have an answer for it. Yes. The only thing I found in this Bible is that He's God. He's I Am. His ways are higher than mine. His thoughts are higher than mine. It's beyond my comprehension, so I don't go there. I just say, Lord, I trust You. Because You said You know all, You see all, and You're in all. And You work together for good in all things. I don't even understand how He does that. I just know His God. His God's love is so great. His mercy is so great. His grace is greater than our hearts. We pray that grace upon them. We shouted grace, grace today. Not by might or power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. See, we have to be so prepared for the days we're coming into. You better have thick skin, but don't lose your soft heart. The hardest part in this world today is having a thick skin. Jeremiah 1 says he's going to make you a fortified wall of bronze. So when the persecution comes, it's like water on a duck's back just slides off. Yes, so you don't like me. It's Jesus you don't like, but you'll get over yourself. See, I like it almost when people get upset when I'm out there witnessing to somebody and preaching Jesus in the store or something. You can see the faces they make. You know why I get smiling? Because God's convicting them. They just didn't like to hear the truth I was speaking. Amen? So don't take it personal. And I don't take it personal anymore. When I was younger, I didn't, Lord. But you mature in Christ. Amen? Amen. Look at this warning in 2 Peter 1 through 3. But there are also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways. Because of the way of truth will be blasphemy. Wow. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle. Their destruction does not slumber. It shows you how merciful God is. When I was screaming this early in my walk with Christ, 29, 30, 31 years ago, almost 32 years ago in Southern California, telling ministers, telling some Bible groups and stuff, that this was going to come against the pulpit, Oh no, God wouldn't do that. No, He says He's going to judge His house first in Peter. Did you miss that? But you read the rest of that chapter when you got time, how God deals with the false prophets and false teachers. It says you'd have been better off to have a millstone tied around your neck, thrown in the bottom of the sea, than to lead anybody astray. That's right. So I dare not sit in my office 25, 26, 27 hours a week making sure this is what God wants to feed you. I feed you up here the Word of God so you have a meal to chew on the rest of the day. But today's a very big warning to the church. I mean, it even says, uh, 
in Revelation. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit would say. You need to be discerning, church. You really need to have ears to hear the Holy Ghost now. Because that dream that woman had, it troubled her big time and you could see it. She was actually heartbroken by the fact that this so-called man of God handed her a get, a get well book. Not the Bible, not scriptures, didn't pray for her, nothing. And she had to, she sat and she prayed, God, what does all this mean? And then he explained it to her. Like I said, if somebody really loves you <clears throat> and they care about you, if all these pastors in the pulpit really love their congregations, they would preach this word. That's right. They would tell them this is the infallible word, and we're all going to bow to this, by the way. Come judgment day, everybody stands before the living word of God, and they're going to give an account. I don't want to get there and think I missed something. Some days I feel like I have, but I know God ensures me in my heart. He says, I knew how long it was going to take me to break you. Oh. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you talk about brokenness in the body of Christ, how many times do you people talk about that in you? You know what brokenness is? You've given up on you. All your trust and hope is in Jesus. That's what broke you. Finally come to a place, you look in the mirror and go, Boy, I wasted a lot of years putting a lot of hope and expectation in myself, didn't I? That's right. Yeah, we do. And you know what? It's your human DNA, and it's hard to let go of that part of you. For a mother, it's hard not to be nurturing and caring to the children. The children are grown adults, and they're out doing their own thing, and they're still trying to be a mother and saying, Listen, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Mm. Yeah. Parents got to learn to do that. When you have grown children and they want to go sideways, rebuke them in the name of Jesus. It says to admonish your children. But in 62, when we threw God out of the classroom, parents started to become their children's friend. No adult that has young children is your child's friend. They are not your friend. They are a child to be raised in the ways of the Lord. I don't care what the circumstance is. Raise them in this way and they're not going to depart far from it, the Bible says. Amen? When I talk about these deceptive words that are all over the TV, that's why I'm glad I don't even have a TV. Mm -hmm. Everybody goes, when you get a TV in your house, don't know, don't care. <laughs> Need landscaping first, amen? Yes. Need a baptism pool, amen? Amen. amen. Jesus. Mm -hmm. First things first. Kingdom first. Amen. Yes. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> amen. One of the biggest commands in the Bible for a blessed life. Seek his kingdom, his righteousness first. All these things are added to you. Mm. We don't teach that anymore. Yes, mm. amen. There's too many motivational speakers, and I'm not judging the pulpit, but this is stuff God's been telling me for almost 32 years. You will not be motivated in here other than to follow Jesus. If I do anything else other than motivate you and convict you by the words that God gives me to give you, to be closer and to be more in love with Jesus, I have failed you. Mm. And that would wreck me. Amen. It's what I live for, church. I've been so blessed by God to even have the honor of being called His own son. Yes. I did nothing to deserve it. I can't earn it. I can't buy my way in. But I have the great honor from God to even stand before you and call you my family. I did nothing to deserve any of this. On a Sunday morning, I said, Jesus, if there's use for me, here I am. And he, uh, he shoes me. And he said, it's only going to get better. Amen. He says in Proverbs, our future is going to get brighter and brighter under the noonday sun. That means it's going to get brighter and brighter until I go home. Amen. Amen. So I don't look at the darkness. I look at the light that we walk in in Jesus' name. When I talk about having discernment, Proverbs 2, 1 through 3, if you got your Bibles. See, when God instructs us in things in the Word, this is an instruction manual. It's how to live, how to think, how to breathe, how to treat one another, how to love God, be in awe of God. But He gives us so many instructions in the Bible, that's why we need to spend more time in the Word and not in the world. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. <clears throat> it's so important. In Proverbs 2, 1-3, through 3, it says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that, look at this, so you incline. That means listen to your ear to wisdom. Incline your ear to wisdom. Apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment 
and lift up your voice for understanding. Wow. Cry out for discernment. Let me tell you, church, thank God that you have discernment of spirits and what you're hearing. Because there's a lot of slick willies out there trying to seduce you with seductive words, covetous new words, to get you to give them all you got. I was reading a thing on the computer the other day, a lot, a lot of people have left churches. Some of the things these pastors told these people, my God, you talk about not knowing the Lord, ho, ho, no, and no, and oh, heck no. No. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what this says. And if it isn't backed up with the grace of God, I shouldn't be saying it. Amen? 1 John 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. When you, need for, when you read 1 John, those chapters in there, you'll read everybody says, well, when the Antichrist comes, let me tell you something, you're deceived, because the Antichrist is here living and alive and well. That's right. It says in three or four different spots in, in 1 John, the Antichrist is already in all the earth. So the spirit of the Antichrist, if you look in the White House, it's working right yes, there. Yes. If you look in the Senate, the Congress, the House, mayors, governors, it's working right there. Like I said, we better start interceding for this country because Colorado just signed a law yesterday, the other two days ago. They rejoiced over it. That everything goes. I mean, any kind of lifestyle. They want to approve of any child that wants to change his sex. How he signed that and didn't die on the spot, I don't know. You talk about no fear of God and these people in our government, well, they're going to have fear because let me tell you something, they're going to meet King Jesus. And eternity is forever. Let me tell you something, I have flashback, he showed me what that was like in Sodom and Gomorrah in the days of Noah when he flooded the earth for these sins, when he burned up millions of people for these sins. Let me tell you something, God doesn't play. He does not play. Amen, glory is right. He doesn't play. He's serious. The warnings from heaven are everywhere. They're taking all these, they're talking all this climate change stuff. I'm going, really? Oh yeah, Merry Christmas. There's no such thing. There's an acceptance of darkness change. We've perverted the ways of holiness and righteousness. But let me tell you something, God's just warming up, church. But you as a body of believers, I ask in Jesus' name that you bow your knee to Jesus. They said, Lord, I want to give me discernment in my hearing, what I see and what I hear, so I don't get pulled into false teaching and false doctrines and false ways of living. Because God does not change. He does not, will not. What was sin in Genesis is sin now. It hasn't changed. And it never will change. So do not compromise. Do not give up. If you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews 10. We're just about done. Hmm. We're just going to read 35 to 39. This is why I say we need to persevere. Because remember something, this life is but a vapor. I don't care if you live to 120. Eternity has no beginning and no ending. That's where we're going. So when I look at this life, even Paul said this temporary suffering is but for a moment's time compared to the eternal weight of glory that awaits us when we get home. So whatever we go through now, look at it as temporary. That's right. And then it won't be so bad. Because we make mountains out of molehills. Oh my God, this. Oh my God, this. Oh my God, that. Really? No, praise Jesus. We're on our way to heaven. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I know. I went too far, didn't I? I didn't hit Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 3. I'm sorry. This is so important that you see this. Because he's addressing Israel right here. But because they got the branches broken off, you got grafted in. Yeah. The light they were supposed to be, you became. See, you need to be praising Israel right now in their rebellion. Amen. Isaiah 60, 1 through 3, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness to people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. See, Israel rejected the light when it came. That's in John the first chapter. The light has come into the world. It's so important you see Jesus is the light. That's in John 1, 4 through 9. So now that you see that, let me tell you something. You became the light, Matthew. It says we're the light, the salt and the light of the earth. You're carriers of the light. They lost the light. Now they're being grafted in right now. The 12 tribes are coming back from all over the globe, and they're coming back into the olive tree. Remember, there's one olive tree. 
There's one flow of olive oil, and that comes from Christ himself. He is the olive tree that you grafted into. But you became the light that shines. But guess what? The covenant in Israel is still, it can't ever be broken. So he's going to rise up in Israel. But when he rose on the third day, the light had come. He conquered sin and death. Now the glory of God is in all of us. Amen? Amen. So let your light shine before men that they see everything you do bring glory to God. Hebrews 10. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. That's eternal life. For yet a little while he who is coming will come and not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but to those who believe in the saving of the soul. Amen. See, you're here for a season. You're here for a season. One season, He gives you X amount of years to fulfill your destiny. So it's so important that you see that. When He says endurance, that means persevere. That means stand fast in the ways of the Lord. That means not to compromise anything that God has taught you and how to live and believe and move out and have your being. It's all about who you are now as new creations, spiritual creations with God in Christ. It's so important today that you get a hold of this. i got a promise. John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to before you to prepare you, but I'm going to come get you and bring you home. Those first three verses in John the 14th chapter should make you happy. There's a mansion waiting for us. When we did, when we, when we did Kay's service last week, she loved swimming. And I brought up that verse in Revelation. There's a river down the middle of life. I kind of got a picture. She said, Jesus, I'll be right back. I'm going swimming first. <laughs> She loved the water. My wife used to take her to the pool and used to do exercises early in the mornings. And it was like God showed me. She got up here just as, I'm going swimming. Pew, right in the river. Yeah. See, we, we rejoice in heaven. We worship in heaven. Amen. See, my promises, my mansion, eternal glory, love, peace, and joy with Christ, worshiping Him for all eternity, no beginning and no end. Yeah. So the endurance part, it takes a whole new meaning when you know what awaits us. The glory that awaits us. Malachi 4 chapter. When I say not to look at the wicked, there's a reason. I love the opening of this verse, verses 1 through 3. When God makes a statement, the conversation's over. When God says, I will and I'm gonna, it's over. When God says, I watch over my word and I'll perform it. When God says, all my promises are yes and amen in my son Jesus Christ. It's over. It's done. It's finished. It's a, it's a done deal. Yeah. So either you believe that His Word is living and active, and everything it was sent to do, it's going to do, or you don't. I believe the whole book. Amen. That's why I preach from the whole book. You don't leave part of it out. Please don't do that. Malachi 4, when I say don't waste your time worrying about the wicked, pray for their salvation, there's a reason I say that. Because, watch. Verse 1, Malachi 4, 1 through 3. For behold, the day is coming burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will, stu will stumble, will, will be stubble. Oof. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that they will leave them neither root nor branch. There will be nothing left to them. They will be stubble. It's all going to be burned up. That's in Peter. Fervent heat from heaven is coming. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stole fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I do this, says the Lord. Amen. See, do we pray for the wicked? Yes. Do we judge them? No. <coughs> you know why? Because the day is coming. That's right. God said there's a day coming, and they're going to be burned up. Like I said, that's, see, our belief in Christianity and in Christ you choose where you spend eternity. That's something you've got to start sharing with people. I don't believe in Jesus. That's okay. You get to choose whether you spend eternity with Him or not. See, we need to start getting really point blank with people because people's hearts are hardened more than ever. You can see no fear of God and what's happening with this whole woke movement. Now it's backfiring. That's a shame, man. The House of Bush has lost like $6 billion in market value. It breaks my heart, doesn't it? The wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. Amen. Amen. The transfer of wealth has already begun. Oh, to bankrupt the, the alcohol companies. 
And some of you may have a drink once in a while. I don't, but praise God, I saw the damages of alcohol and drugs, so I'm, I'm solely against it. I am hardcore against it. I despise it. I watch the destruction in my own family, my own lives, and the people around me from it. That's why I pray that every drug dealer be put in prison. That's why every alcohol brewery be put out of business. I'm sorry I'm putting people out of work, but I've seen the damage it does. I've seen the damage it does. So it destroyed my life, but guess what? I have a new life now. God gave me new kidneys. He gave me a new liver. He gave me new lungs. He gave me a new heart that I destroyed. My fault, not the devil's. I knew I was evil. But guess what? In the mercy of Christ, He came and redeemed me and saved me, healed me, made me whole again. So guess what, church? Today is the day of salvation for all who will listen to His name. Today is the day you decide whether you're going to have no fear when you leave here of the persecution that awaits you when you leave here today. See, if I went out in public and feared what people thought of me, I wouldn't be laying hands on people in the produce department of Smitty's. <laughs> I wouldn't be giving words to people. Like last week, it was in uh, the pasta aisle. And then the week before that, it was down by the milk and the eggs. See, I don't care where I am. It used to be the produce section, but God's moving me around all the products now. <laughs> but be available, church. That's right. Never worry even about their response. If you don't get a good response, like I said, it's just conviction. What does Jesus say? My Holy Spirit convicts the world of their sin. You don't need to. The Holy Spirit in you is going to do that. That's why you don't get such a good reception some days. That's why you don't get a big hug and a kiss some days. But guess what? I want my hugs from Jesus and my wife. Amen? Those hugs are what matter the most to me. They really, really do. So it's so important today that you arise from the dead. It's time for us to arise from the dead, church. It's hard. It's broken. It's crushed. I was in my office yesterday afternoon and he was showing me that after I watched these two videos. I put my head in the Bible and I wept. I wept. Because I felt God's heart. We're his children. We've been empowered. We've been given dominion. And we bow to governments and to the ways of the world and the ways of man. I'm never saying leave here, go out and be disrespectful to people. Never do that. Never do that. But when you leave here today, you represent the kingdom of God. You represent the Lord Jesus Christ. But I sat there and wept for 30 minutes. I said, God, forgive me for failing you. I know I've fallen short. I don't know about anybody else. I've got to take accountability for me. I have to work out my own salvation. And I just felt so useless yesterday when he showed me how his heart's broken about his church. And how it has failed the mission it was given to go into all the world to make disciples of all nations. You don't pick by shape, size, nationality, color, what language they speak. God speaks all languages. If you need a language, he'll give it to you. But there's long, one language of God that won't fail. One simple word, love. Say the word love. I don't care what language they speak. They'll know what you're saying. Because they'll feel Jesus coming off your tongue. Say, Jesus loves you. One little sentence to tell people. I don't care what language they speak. But they'll know what that means. Because the Spirit will bring it alive to them. But we need to change. We need to change from the inside out by the Word of God. The Word of God changes us from the inside out, not the outside in. Your physical healing is easy for God. It's our spiritual healing, transferring from the old to the new nature that is His biggest project in us when we get born again. It's leaving the old in the old, leaving the past in the past, and becoming that new spiritual powerhouse that you're all created to be. Every one of you has been empowered by Christ Jesus to do the greater works, to lead people to salvation, to lay hands on the sick, to cast out demons. Like I said, the devil should have been terrified the moment you got out of bed and said, I can't wait to go worship Jesus this morning in church. 
slow that person down, Father, in Jesus' name. Pray over these highways and the byways in this city. They're driving worse than ever. They've given up hope in life because they don't have Christ. That's what I told the woman at the bank the other day. She said, why are people so angry? I said, because they don't know Jesus. They don't have His peace. They try to get it here, but you can't. You can only get it from the Prince of Peace. So preach peace. Preach love. Preach kindness. Preach compassion. Preach mercy. Tell them that they're loved and adored by their Creator. And that God made Him in their very image and His very likeness. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Fathers, we come before you gathered in the holy name of Jesus. You had me pray for the church today. Your children, your bride. And you showed me it's gone so far from the ways of the Word of God even. There's so many doctrines of demons out there, oh God, that didn't come from heaven, they came from hell. But you also showed me you're raising up a remnant church that cries out, just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus, Father. And I pray that that change every heart in here, everyone watching online, that they realize there is no life, there's no existence, there's no promise of life unless they have the Son of God living in them. So, Lord, as we leave here today, let us be changed. Change our hearts and our minds to think what you think, to see what you see, to love the way you love, to do the things you sent your Son to do, because when He ascended up to your right hand, He handed the baton of life and power and authority of the kingdom to the church and said, Now go out and do the greater works and make disciples of all nations, for that is the calling of all my children, saith the Lord. So this day, Father, we surrender our hearts to you. We are your bride, Jesus. What's ever in us that's not of you, we thank you for the fire today. That come and burn out any ungodly thought, any ungodly attitude, any bitterness, any unforgiveness, any fault-finding, judgmentalism, whatever it is, Lord, it didn't come from you. Because what came was your mercy on the cross 2,000 years ago when you put your son there instead of us. Your mercy endures forever, O oh God. It is so great. It spared us the punishment of our sins. That's how powerful mercy is, Father. The mercy of the Father saved us from the wrath to come. So when we leave here and depart here, we come home to spend eternity worshiping you and glorifying your name. Let us be those vessels of your glory, O oh God, of all that you are. Father, we just thank you today that this is the day that we bow our knee to you and say, Lord, the rest of our lives, it's never going to be about us. It's going to be about glorifying your Holy Son, Jesus. We praise you. We thank you this new day. And as we leave here today, take us by the hand and lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God is good.